Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to just tell you a little bit about myself. I did for the Codex group, but I know there are others here. Um, so as Ben said, I'm Assistant Director for Digital Learning at Davidson College, which means I head the digital learning team, which is part of the library at Davidson. And I'm an instructor, instructional designer, is how I started. Um, and I uh, have been focusing a lot on online teaching and learning. I think I can hear Jacob's yes, little, sorry. little one. <laughs> sorry for getting a little. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no okay. problem. So I just want to say that I'm really excited to kind of focus on digital projects and that way of looking at um, digital learning today with you. And so I apologize. My life has been so hectic that I'm having a really hard time just like taking time and just enjoying things. So I'm really going to try to do that during this workshop and I encourage you to do the same. Um, I'm curious how everyone else is feeling too. Um, if you wouldn't mind just giving a quick word in the chat or an emoji. If you do control command spacebar, you can get your emoji uh, menu up. But just a word about how you're feeling right at this moment. Uh, it doesn't even have to be a feeling. It could just be something that reflects what you're going through right now. <laughs> so just a word, if you would just share that in the chat, a word or two or an emoji. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> All right. That makes me feel a little better. There's a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of energy going around, a lot of voices in our heads, right? Ditto. Okay. Um, I really appreciate folks every once in a while saying, you know, like, I'm healthy and I'm here. Yay. Curious. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to keep letting those go through and letting you read them and uh, hear about the folks who are in the room with you in our virtual room, trying to figure out ways to really feel like we're in the same room. I'm going to start sharing my screen, uh, but I cannot host. Can I please have the power? Let me help you with that. And I get to read more of these, so that's good. OK, Gosh, give that another try. Fantastic. Thank you. I also have tried, let's see, let's make sure. Uh, it did not work. I really tried to get uh, videos. I have a dual screen. And if someone tells me in the end, like how to do this, because it's really driving me crazy that my videos are over here and my presentations here. And so when I look here, it's just very confusing. And I haven't figured it out yet because I just started using dual screen at home. All right, so I kind of changed my uh, title of the of the workshop because uh, thank you so much for the 17 of you who filled out my form on a weekend. I greatly appreciate that. I wanted to just really figure out where you were coming from, even though I knew some about your projects. Um, and so I really use that to um, kind of tweak my workshop a little bit. So um, hopefully it's still something helpful uh, for all of you, both team members and non-team members. So right here is a bit.ly link. If you are one of those people who likes to kind of follow along at your own pace or look ahead or have the links for everything, you're welcome to jump in there and have that, or you can take it for later. And I'll share it out later. Agenda, I like doing what we're doing, what we're going into. So here it is. Uh, we'll start out with just, um, we've already done our introductions actually. And we're going to look a little bit at the survey info that um, you shared with me. Um, then I'll go into talking about collaborative elements of digital projects. And I really honed it down to kind of three areas that I wanted to talk about to make it practical as well as um, interesting. And so we're going to take those three elements then to do activity one, um, which will be random groups. You won't be working with your teams. We'll take a break because that's super important. Um, then we'll do a bit of sharing out and then we'll jump into activity two, which kind of builds off activity one. And we'll be a little bit different for those who are part of a codex team and those who are just joining from Ohio 5. 
right? Those are the folks. Okay. Um, and then hopefully there'll be time at the end for questions and closing thoughts. By the way, uh, this is my next slide and I don't have participants open right now, nor do I have chat open. So let me do that. Okay. I'm gonna give me one second to adjust all my little windows. Okay. So um, maybe you, you have trouble with following the chat while you're presenting as well. <laughs> So I will be glancing at it sometimes and asking things, um, but I really appreciate if you do want to jump in, just raise your hand using uh, in the participants panel using the little blue hand, because that jumps up to the top of my participants list and I can, um, you can unmute your mic and just jump in. I think that's usually the, the easiest way to kind of uh, bring up questions and feel like we're in the same room. Thank you for sharing the bit.ly address, folks. I, I thought I kept it up there, but it's always uh, too short, shorter than you think. So again, just feel free to raise your hand at any point to stop me um, and hop in with a question or a comment. So uh, one of the questions I asked in the survey was why a digital project? Um, and I want to, uh, acknowledge a couple things. A lot of you said you one of your goals for Codex and this workshop was to learn from your colleagues and learn from others and share ideas. And so I'm really going to try to honor that today because I know there's a lot of expertise in this room, a lot of experience, and people have done different things. And one of the great things about uh, institution, institutes like this and workshops, collaborative workshops, are being able to share what we've done and learn from others. And I think we have a rich room of uh, knowledge and expertise, and we have different people in different roles as well, which always um, makes, in my mind, for greater collaboration. But one of the questions I asked was, why do a digital project? Um, and I think this is a really good question, especially now. It's been brought up like, this is um, the fact that we're, you know, in this, era where we need to do remote things, I think this question even changes. But some of the answers, and there was a lot of overlapping answers, and I just put the ones that were most common. So there was a lot of wanting to build community, especially if we're off campus. So again, this is very, very specific to the situation we're in today. To help build connections using visuals, similar. Build digital literacies and collaborative skills. Uh, reach broader audiences. And a big one was more student engagement. And I highlighted these uh, student engagement and build community in blue. Does anyone know why I highlighted those? Any guesses on why those kind of like stood out to me the most? And you can jump in with the chat or if you want to like raise your hand and jump in and be brave, that would be awesome. I'll give it a couple seconds to see if anyone's brave enough. I guess it's, why are those two things related and super important right now? Yay, Cheryl, thank you. Go ahead and jump in, Cheryl. Okay, I'll take a stab at it. Um, we um, are in such an unusual situation and all this time, um, spent with trying to connect people through this um, computing interface. It's so difficult. And um, when you have a digital project, um, this can be a means of drawing students in and keeping them engaged, which of course as they as they talk with each other and imagine how they're going to work together to build something together that draws them together as a team, makes them feel like um, they belong and um, builds that aspect of community, tying them to the larger group, to the class, to the professor. You said it so very well, Cheryl. Thank you so much. That's exactly what I, would, I was thinking. These are two things that keep coming up as we're talking about how to do 
uh, learning in this environment that we're in right now and how important building community is and student engagement and digital projects just really lend themselves to those things, especially kind of digital humanities based projects where they're doing collaborative work. Um, I think it's really an opportunity for us. So I really want to keep remembering that and working that into um, the plans that you're doing for your, your projects. All right. So the way I'm going to talk about this is through a course that I have taught, uh, co-taught with my collaborator, Suzanne Churchill. And I, of course, want to mention her and give her a big shout out because she is a large part of the class. I've uh, learned so much from her and I want to make sure that um, I don't speak about this like it is my class. It is not. It is a complete collaboration. Um, and just to let you know, I had a slide of her and all her work and I wanted to share the presentation with her and make sure that she could talk about it uh, and give me any feedback to make sure I was representing what we do. And she was like, the only feedback is make sure on that slide to put us both. This is a collaborative project. Why would you, why would you just put me up there? So um, she's an excellent collaborator. And so here's just a little bit about us. These are our Bitmojis that we would change weekly um, during our online teaching to make it a little more personable. Uh, we're both kind of corny like that, so, so it worked. But what I want to say is I'm going to use digital design as a way to talk about um, collaborative aspects of digital projects and to give some real examples. Um, and so it is a, um, it is a English course and a digital studies course. We've taught it twice. Uh, usually about um, 12 to 16 students take it. And basically, students are uh, students do a digital scholarship project. That is the course um, from beginning to end. We started with students doing it individually, and then last year we switched to them doing it collaboratively. And so um, they work throughout the entire semester um, doing their own research on a topic that neither Suzanne or I are experts in. Um, but we walk them through the process of doing a digital scholarship project and connecting with um, the, the experts that they need to be connecting with as well. That's just a little bit of background on that, but I won't, I won't be going into um, some details. So um, as a way to talk about the elements of a digital project, so again, I realize that a lot of you are doing a digital project within a course, right? So this is more, the course itself is walking students through digital projects, but I think there's a lot of nice overlap and this is a nice way to think about it. And so what I wanted to do was share with you the assignments that are part of the process that students go through when they're creating their project. And as I'm talking through this, I would love for you to think about your projects and think about what's similar and what might be different um, in your approach to um, doing a digital project that has both um, these technical um, and other skill building aspects, but also has real content and research that has to get done and where those things come together. Um, and so that's the website for the course. Everything's there. So it's open. You can look at any of it. Um, some things are better than others, right? We're constantly improving. But um, I will be referring to that site a lot just to show you examples. And so what happens first is students um, do project proposals. So they each come with like their own idea, right? And so everyone does a actual, um, you know, short paper on what they want their project to be. Um, but then they have to pitch it to the class. And so they pitch it to the class and the class gets to vote on whether or not um, which projects they would do in ranking order. And so it's a way to kind of get collaboration, but make sure that students have the chance to really voice why they want to do their project. Um, and so once they're actually grouped up into their projects and some of them have said goodbye to their project idea, at least for, for that semester, and they've joined somebody else in their idea, 
they do a think piece that says like, hey, this is how I connect to this new project I'm doing. So they're constantly like getting these chances to commit to the project and to make it their own. And then that group gets together and does a strategic plan for how they're gonna get their project done. They do an outreach and sustainability plan for how they're gonna share their project and how it's gonna live after the class. And then they start doing the research, right? They start doing the literature review. They start reaching out to other faculty members that we've connected them with that are experts in the subject areas that they're researching. And they start doing a content draft where they're writing the things that they want to be in their site. But they're also thinking about like, this is a digital project and I want to do these other things. How do I incorporate those things? And so they build the site, prototype one and type two. They revise. They have a final project, which is an open website. But then the last thing is a white paper, the reflection piece. And these are all elements that you, I've heard you all mention either in your kind of um, the slides this morning and your goals and what you're thinking about doing, and also in some of the answers that you gave me in the, um, in the form. So this is just how we broke up the assignments. And I thought it would, might be interesting to think about how you are also breaking up those assignments, the ones that are about the content, the ones that are about collaboration, and the ones that are about skill building. Uh, I just wanted to mention, after two runs, some of our lingering questions, assignments when you're doing group work, uh, which are group work and which are individual, right? Um, do we give due dates or do they create due dates as part of a strategic plan? We hop back and forth. Um, how do we give more feedback and less grades? So those are all big questions, not gonna be answered, but just to let you know what we're still thinking about. So what I've pulled out from what we've done, and I want to give you tangible things that you could possibly work with as you're thinking about your projects, is team building strategies, continuous feedback strategies, and our approach to skill building. So it's unapproach, right? So team building strategies. Um, a lot of people were talking about collaboration, um, groups being equitable, um, students being engaged. And all of this, I think, relies on group work, right? The fact that groups work well together. Um, and projects can be a great way to do this. I broke up some of the things we did as a class and then as groups to really start building that. I also mentioned things that we got student feedback from that said, this really, really helped me feel like I was part of the class, like I belonged, that we had a good environment for learning. So we got a lot of good feedback on these specific strategies. So first day, first day activities, icebreakers, we all do them. They're all over the place, right? So there's so many ideas for good icebreakers. The one we chose was, who are you? What should we call you? And something you read or watched or did for fun over the break. So this was before our lives um, changed, had changed so much. So this was pre-COVID. Um, and this is a class that was started in person and then went online, right? And so we just got to know each other a little bit, right? Um, I think some time really needs to get spent on um, building community and building groups and building trust between them. Um, and taking away some possible time for content. I think it's really, really important. The other uh, thing we did on the first day was um, a peak expertise game. Has any one of you um, participated in the op-ed project? They do workshops on um, writing, writing op-eds and how important it is and trying to get more um, women's voices and voices of color. Uh, opinion pieces out there that are strong. No. Okay. Um, sorry, just making sure I'm not. Great. Um, so the game is that you have to say it very specifically. Um, you're in a room, so you're in a room with people, and you're saying, in this room, I'm going to claim that I'm an expert and I'm going to tell you why. And so you have a little time 
it can be an expert in anything, right? It can be something silly, it can be uh, something serious, it can be uh, something you're interested in, right? So it could be really anything. If you look around in the room, how can you claim to be an expert in this thing? And you're gonna tell us why. And so very clearly you have to state like, my name is Sunday Richard and I'm an expert in blah because blah. And uh, it's a really hard thing to do. Um, people are really uncomfortable with it. And, um, but you learn a lot, right? You learn what people care about, you learn what people are interested in and you are all vulnerable together in some way. And so you have a debriefing after and you kind of talk through like, why was that uncomfortable? Um, and things like that. And what comes out is the question, if I had asked you instead to say, I am a resource for, and would you be more comfortable? And yeah, people are like, yeah. And so why is that different, right? Why, why can an expert be a resource? And I think that's a really great idea for um, digital humanities collaborative projects as well, because you always rely on other people who don't, uh, who have different expertise than you. You have to, because you can't have all the expertise, right? So I thought it was a, a complete wonderful game for, um, for a digital humanities group. And maybe if we have time, uh, we can also play it. I've never done it in an online environment. Um, I don't know if we'd have people turn their videos on as well, but um, I'm just curious if, if we have time, would folks want to try that game? You can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. A little, a couple shrugs. Sounds fun. Sure. Okay. We'll see if we have, if we have time. I want to keep, keep on task. Um, other building team building strategies, uh, student agency and forming groups. So I know um, a question that a lot of you are thinking through is how students will have choice in the projects that you're working on. How do you build that choice in, in a way that makes sense where you still um, are able to get done what you, what you would like to get done with them. Um, and so I think I already explained this to you. It's like the project pitch. This is where they had agency, the vote, and the think piece. And then the strategic plan. I, the students did it. And so I would encourage you to think about some of the work that you're doing now, but then possibly that students could do so that they would have more agency in, what, in the projects that you're doing, right? So they decided what their goals were for their project and they broke them down and they decided who was doing what and they explained it all. And so I gave you two links there. You can totally look at them right now um, if you want to. One, I think one group did a really good job at creating goals and the other group did a really good job at identifying roles. And so I just gave you kind of two examples of, of how students did that. But a really, a really fun thing. I also, yeah, let me see. Hopefully I ordered my slides correctly. Oh yeah. So I have two slides to share from Suzanne's uh, presentation or workshop that she took them through for strategic planning, um, keys to a successful project. I think this is a really nice way to like inspire students. So if you know the five C's of uh, project work, one of them is connections. So really like the hook. So I think this talking about a, a project in this way can help inspire students. And the students in that class were very interested in not writing papers and being able to do something that was meaningful. So really taking advantage of that possibility that students want that. Um, I also think this would be a fun thing to annotate together as a group. Um, I didn't wanna add technologies and uh, so I decided not to annotate this, but I think it would be a really fun thing to do. Um, and then this is the other exercise that Suzanne did that I think is really helpful for groups. We did it as a full class, but I think you could do it as, um, as individual working groups as well if you had smaller groups. And it's what are your opening openers and closers? What, what do you need to be successful in a collaborative partnership? And what, what makes you shut down? This is probably the one that like they talked about more because um, you know it's difficult it's more difficult, I think, to talk about the things that you need for a good, successful, collaborative communication 
and what things actually hinder that. So um, really short, short and easy thing to do in a group to really figure out what the communication is and know, know a little bit more about each other. I think this one actually would be really good for um, online as well, because I think communication online has given us um, even more ways to, um, to communicate, right? Like email, we have Slack, we have text, we have video calls, we have phone calls. There's just been so many more. So like figuring out what are the ways that your group wants to talk to each other? And what are ways that you don't want to talk to each other? Any questions or thoughts so far that you wanted to, anyone wants to jump in? All right. All right, and um, sorry, is it the third? Yeah, no, the second. So another group of possible strategies that might help you in your planning is continuous feedback. I think probably this is something that you, of course, already know, but thinking of ways, again, to do it, right? So for us, we did chunking, right? Like chunking the lit, uh, literature review, content draft, prototype, so making things um, doable and continuous. So they're, they get feedback on this stuff from both the instructors and from their peers. Uh, when I talked to Ben about this workshop, I brought up a couple words that usually make me uncomfortable too. And I, there's so many things, like I definitely don't call students customers ever, ever, ever. But I know that there are um, ways to talk things like prototyping that sounds very like, you know, uh, corporate design <laughs> and not necessarily digital humanities design. But I think it's a really good way to think about, and some of these words make sense and I'm gonna use them. So prototyping is one and that just means, and I think actually there might've been one of the slides this morning that said, that used prototype as well, right? You were gonna do a small prototype of one of the, uh, what you expected students to do. So I'm glad I'm not the only one, um, but it's a way to, get something up there so that you can get feedback and then change it. Um, and we ended up from first round to second round, uh, going from like four prototypes to two. We realized that you can over prototype and then you just don't put in the time and energy in between that um, actually is needed. We used hypothesis for peer annotation and peer review, which was really, really helpful. Um, one of the comments in the survey is, uh, I think it was somebody made um, these great twine videos, uh, twine games, but it took a lot of time and effort to go th through each one. I might be like combining things, I apologize. But that is something that I think we all think about when doing digital projects, like how do you actually give these the time and that they deserve to be looked at thoroughly and to be, um, you know, used thoroughly. So one way is, of course, to break it down and have uh, peer feedback and revision. We did speed dating um, for usability testing, another one of those words, <laughs> our UX design, right? So, um, but students loved this and we did it, it was an online um, activity. So we were in Zoom and we paired them and they had three minutes and three minutes to look through each other's projects speaking out loud, giving feedback. The person whose project it was was sitting down, writing things down, not saying anything, not directing them to do anything. And then they switched places. Um, and then we would switch them in breakout rooms over so that they got feed multiple people. So we had done it in the classroom. It's really easy to do in the classroom. It wasn't necessarily easy to do in Zoom, but it worked and the students loved it. Um, and then we just invited them to come to our office hours so we could also give them that, that type of feedback. Um, question here, what is the definition of openers, closers, not opening a class session? It's related to strategic plan. Yeah, sorry. So openers and closers are just um, cute names to give what types of things open you up and what types of things close you off 
specifically about communication. So when you're thinking about group work um, and you're working with your, your collaborators, what kinds of things just turn you off, right? What kinds of things just shut you down and what kind of things encourage you to, to communicate and collaborate? Does that make sense, Emily? Yes, thank you. Awesome, okay. All right. Almost done with this portion and then you all get to jump in here as well because I know you have a lot to add to this. Um, third thing I wanted to draw out that folks talked about was this idea of skill building. And we're talking about several things, right? We're talking about digital literacies. We might be talking about specific platforms. We're talking about uh, other soft skills, um, communication, all these things, right? So working these into your, um, the things that you, your learning outcomes and the things that you actually need students to learn about the content that you're teaching them. And so um, our approach was actually to really simplify in some ways um, and really identify, and I think a lot of you have actually already done this and decided like, we're gonna use this technology because, and then when you choose, the good thing about choosing the technology, technology that, that you use, right, then you can connect it to your, your course goals or your learning outcome, and it can really be an actual part of the course that counts, uh, which is, I think, really, really important. So I, I shared with you our course goals and learning outcomes, and um, I'll let you just take a look at those on your own time, but I just wanna say that we pulled, we pointed to the, some of the skill building that we were doing because it was important and we wanted to make sure to let them know that they were getting credit for it, that they were, that it was um, important and that um, it, was also, it was also important for them. Excuse me. Oh, maybe it was a, an unmute, an unknown unmute. Okay. okay. Um, so the things that we focused on was domains were a, a reclaim uh, a domain of one's own school um, and using WordPress within that. Um, and then UX design and social media were a big part of what we were hoping that the students would develop. And those are things that they wanted for resumes. So I know that's not what we're all doing, but it's helpful for them and um, anything we can do to, to you know, um, give them those, those, those tools and that access. Um, gave them multiple opportunities to use these tools. So I know people have already been saying this, a lot of people said scaffolding was a major part of a, a, a successful digital project. Um, the ways that we did scaffolding was because they were doing their final project in WordPress, our class was in WordPress, their assignments were in WordPress. Um, they created their own WordPress before, you know, for their work, even outside of what they did for their uh, group work. Um, so just really getting in there and um, getting comfortable with it and getting comfortable being uncomfortable with it. Um, and then this part, I mean, students loved this. It, it was harder to do in an environment but we decided um, that you know WordPress was their their thing. We told them you know you have to do WordPress, you have to do these research methods, but then we want you to do like interactive stuff with particularly to your content. Like you're choosing the stuff that you're going to use. We're going to show you all sorts of stuff that you might want to use, and then you're going to have to make the decisions. So the way that we did that was just offering a slew of workshops. Um, inviting people in to do them. And so these are some of the ones, Story Map JS, WordPress plugins, um, basics of using CSS, usability testing, accessible, accessibility testing. Um, and again, students like them a lot, but it was harder to do. In online, if we had more time, I think we would have changed it to asynchronous stuff with questions um, and like maybe working like a working hour where you know you're troubleshooting together or something like that instead of trying to work that I think the problem we ran into with this type of stuff and I would love to hear from others about this um, your digital workspace right like I have my two screens right now I'm really lucky to have two screens in my home 
most students have a laptop. That's their digital workspace. So if you're trying to do a Zoom thing and have them learn something where they have to like go somewhere and do the thing, that's a lot for that space. Um, so just figuring out how to do that. So those are the three areas and I hope, um, I hope those were helpful examples for you to start thinking about the things that, that you are doing with your groups. Um, so what I want this first activity to really be is sharing of ideas, because I know you have already done a lot of this stuff. So kind of taking from those three breakdowns that I did, team building strategies, um, continuous feedback strategies, and skill building approaches, um, you're going to, or Ben is going to break you out into, you uh, not yet, <laughs> Thanks. Bye, <everyone>. but eventually <laughs> gr groups of four or five this always happens i send people away before i give them the full instructions so i'm trying to give you the full instructions um are you seeing the codex workshop activity yes so i will also share this directly in the chat not privately to cheryl um Um, and you might want to click on it now, although I think it should be still available in your chat when you get into your room. So we're going to be in groups of four or five. So if you're in chat room one, or if you're in uh, breakout room one, you're group one. So I go, went ahead and give you a link. You put your names here, and then you can decide who is going to be the note taker, or if you have several note takers, and you're just going to go through and kind of um, share about what you've learned about these same things. Um, and I'm going to give you, how many minutes did I say I was going to give you? Sorry about that. I flipped back to make sure. Also to check how am I doing on time? 2.12. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're not that bad. No. Um, so it's going to be um, 30 minutes. I'm going to jump in and visit each group. Um, if you have something specific, you can go ahead and, you know, reach out for help and call. I will give prompts at each 10 minutes to make sure and switch to the next group of questions. Um, and again, this is all about sharing things that you've done, things that you're thinking about along these um, kind of strategies that I've pulled out. I always apologize after pulling people out of a breakout room. <laughs> the worst part. And you know, I don't know if anyone else has, has experienced this, but like when we first started talking about Zoom and everything, everyone's like, why would you give 60 seconds to people to come back to the main room? Like, just pull them in. And um, now I know because it gives you a countdown and it allows you to finish a conversation, right? So I did not adjust that. I apologize. Um, <laughs> But uh, I got to jump in on a couple rooms and be a fly on the wall because the conversations were, were going strongly. So I'm really excited to, to get to share um, what happened in those smaller groups. But before we do that, I do want to appreciate that we've been sitting here for an hour. Maybe some of you have been moving around, but I really, really like to take um, breaks in anything longer than 75 minutes. So I, it is 2.36. If we could come back at 2.45, that would be great. So you have like a nine minute, right? And I encourage you to walk around, get water, talk to who you need to talk to, turn off your microphone, your everything. Don't turn it off. Just turn off your microphone and camera and come back at 2.45. All right. All right, folks. Um, if you could just uh using either reaction or in the participants the little uh blue thumbs up since not all of us are using video if you just give me a blue thumbs up like you've made it back from your break yay or a hand raise thumbs up hand raise i'm seeing visible thumbs up reaction okay We will hope everyone has made it back. People are like throwing up the hand raise and then taking it back down. It looks like a wave. 
Yes, thank you, Anna, Trey, Emily, Rick, Jennifer. That's very helpful. Excellent, okay. So um, I'd really like to hear what's happened in your breakout rooms. I definitely uh, stop people from the conversation in the first two rooms I was in because you know it was at the beginning and they were like, what are we doing? And there's that like really awkward moment of like, okay, how do we get started? By the time I got to room three, people were going. So um, I'd really like to touch on all three of these. I definitely heard a lot about team building and group forming in the rooms that I listened in on. And I realized a lot of people just stayed in that space. Group six, I must say, you made it all the way to the end. So you're going to be the ones talking about skill building. So make sure you know who your spokesperson is. Okay. Um, so I will mention two main things that I heard um, to start us off. And then I'll ask if people can especially those people who were talking about these things, if they wanna jump in and, and say a little bit more. Um, the first one was um, how difficult it is to form groups, um, that there's a lot of difficulties, including people joining with friends and, um, or you know, strong students grouping together, um, motivated students grouping together, working through things like that. So I think the group forming is like a really important piece that was so how do we do that um so i, I think that was uh oh, not everyone has their camera on anymore i th think i was in breakout room two for that one but if you all want to jump in and talk about what you were um struggling with there and, and the things that you were coming up with difficulty of group work choosing groups specifically People want to, Rick, your hand is still up. Does that mean you want to talk? You talking my virtual hand or my real hand? <laughs> your virtual hand was up. <laughs> okay, it wasn't supposed to be up, but um, I assume I have to push, raise hand, put it down. Is it down now? It's down. Thank you. So you okay. did want to jump in. That's I didn't okay. Well, it says raise hand, so I didn't realize that you lower it by raising it. <laughs> Christine, I think you were in that room. Or were you in the room talking about... Um, um, we were talking about... Feedback. Yeah, we were talking yeah. a lot about the peer feedback. Christine was with me. But... Um, we did have in our notes a couple of links to some websites about help um, people start to um, to share um, their interests and things like that. So that was a a great um, resource that um, I forgot who among us shared it, but um, anyway, they're there. <laughs> the two two websites. I guess it was Shelly who shared that. Yeah. No one wants to jump in about difficulty in forming groups that matter. I think one of the things that came up in that conversation was trying to find ways that they feel belonging to that group um, and not just letting them choose their friends, right? So challenging them and saying like, hey, um, I'm going to do this anonymously, and it might not be who you think you should be with, um, but how can you get them to buy into that? Trey, did you want to jump in? Well, I was just going to say that when we were talking about this, one of the things that we hit on is that perhaps we shouldn't be thinking about a universal, but um, about the specific course. So Nancy and I both taught classes last year, or in the recent past, where sort of group formation and group work wasn't very difficult to generate in large part because of student interest and content or because of the community of students who are already in the room. So it might be a different thing if you're doing a 300 level um, versus a 100 level intro, intro class. Um, and then there's the question of if a student comes in the door for a literature class and, and encounters a digital humanities project or digital, um, their buy-in might be a little bit different than if they know that's what they're getting from from jump so if the, if the class the title has 
or description has digital humanities in it so that they know what they're getting themselves into when they sign up. It might, all of these things are sort of gonna mitigate the way that you might go about doing some, some community building and then thinking about how you would put groups together. Context, context. Has anyone heard of um, CatMe? Yeah. Has that been helpful in, in creating groups? So CatMe is it, um, you create a student, uh, a survey that students um, fill out and they kind of walk you through, um, I think it's catme.com. Um, if org, someone wants to figure yeah. that out, catme.org. Um, that kind of groups students together based on many different things. And so it's not using groups, it's not the student choosing groups, but algorithms in some way choosing groups, right? But then it's also a mechanism for students giving each other feedback. So this kind of takes us into possibly the next um, thing that folks were talking about, how difficult it is for students to give each other good feedback and why that is. Um, so there are some really good um, ideas that people gave. Uh, so Cheryl, you know, you mentioned that, that your group was talking about that. I wonder if anyone else in that group wants to, to jump in and talk about your, your struggle with getting students to give real feedback um, to their peers and strategies that you've used to get around that. Dean, do you want to jump in here? You were sharing your idea that worked well. Sure. Um, so what we were saying in our group is that um, students are reluctant to give honest yet kind feedback. Help. And uh, one one of our colleagues on uh, in the group said that that was really a problem because um, they tend to them and so it's really not helping this the 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 peer viewed person to to improve and so i was talking about what um what i did last semester which with a paper and i i asked students to peer review introductions and i ended up um basically asking very objective questions to the students it's like you know french introduction needs to include all these things so can you identify and rewrite the thesis can you show me what the thesis of this paper is going to be can you show me what the different parts of that paper in the development are going to be and so this way the student able to write those down and they can say okay well this is a pretty good introduction i could recognize everything and then to uh to to give the opinion piece i would just uh, have any additional comments to help uh your your colleague that uh, that introduction or that paper and so so that worked pretty well because if the students could not give me those very objective um responses then there was a problem and they could articulate that issue to the students they were reviewing. So that's one, one thing that I've, I've been doing now. That's an awesome idea. Thank you, Christine. Really good. Um, I'm just watching hands in case other people want to jump in. I would love for you to jump in. Um, one uh, strategy that I, oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is Ben. Um, I, I don't know if Calvin wants to chime in here, but he, he was, I think raising some some good points about um, building on that idea of um, sorry I'm going to turn my video on uh, students being reluctant and I don't mean to speak for you Calvin so please feel free but um, I like that idea that um, setting up an environment where setting up an environment where students aren't necessarily criticizing a single person but are maybe um, having students pair up so that 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 critique or that criticism is not directed at a single person but towards maybe a smaller group and thereby less lessening that sense of you know the feeling of being threatened or or um the fear of being criticized i think um so I think just an interesting um thought about structuring the environment where that feedback happens uh, whether it's individual feedback or small group group, group feedback Did you want to add anything, Calvin? You don't have to. Just giving you an opportunity. 
No, no. I mean, he's, he summed it up really well. And I, I think I, in addition, really agree with, um, I think it was Christine who just said, uh, you know, when, when you set kind of objective markers over what they should be looking for to give feedback on, that also depersonalizes it. I, I think so much of peer review and students uh, is a reluctance to seem like the bad guy or a reluctance to seem like you're attacking somebody. And so when you uh, depersonalize it, uh, whether it's by putting it in groups or by um, giving them objective criteria that, you know, they have to you know, meet or not meet or um, all that. Anything that you can do to make it so that uh, you aren't attacking someone's, someone personally, but just saying, uh, you know, oh, this is, you know, this is why this doesn't meet X criteria. Joe, do you want to jump in? So this is kind of the equal and opposite approach, I think. Um, and it's based on the fact that I've I've done over the years and, and particularly over the last month, I've done a lot of work with Story Center, which used to be the Center for Digital Storytelling. And in their story circle model of workshopping writing, um, one of the phrases they use a lot is, if it were my story, I would. So actually, this goes away from depersonalizing and goes to really being hyper aware of the fact that your comment is kind of a contingency. Um, and I think that's, uh, what I have noticed is that I use that at work all the time. Ask Alex, you know, that, that you know, I will freak, when I am not prepared to say, you should do it this way, whether that's because I'm really not prepared or because I'm not emotionally prepared, you know, that I will, I will call attention to, here's one approach and it's the approach that would be attractive to me so depending on the kind of peer review um, i think that might that uh, sometimes the students just don't know the move yet and that's a move that i think can be useful oh someone had their hand up and they put it back down so i'm guessing we don't want to talk again but that's okay yeah really good point um one thing i wanted to add in was um, this idea that comes from actually like skill building for outdoors things so that um, groups can come together and help each other kind of do these like outdoor challenges. So not from an academic setting, but the way that they practice giving each other feedback. And again, finding ways to give, like to get, get practice doing it before it's higher stakes, right? Like on little things um, is describing feedback and let me know if you've heard this as well. Um, in candy, trail mix, or garlic, right? So there's different types of feedback. Sometimes you want to give candy. You just want to make somebody feel good and say, like, you've worked hard on this. Like, this is great. Um, and that's, that's candy feedback. It doesn't really have, you know, much substance to it, but it feels good. It tastes good. Trail mix, that middle ground where you're um, mixing it with, uh, you know, nice language and, and encouragement, but also like giving them some, some concrete ways that they might be able to um, uh, change something. And then garlic, which is not bad, right? But nobody eats garlic straight off. Like nobody just pops garlic in their mouth. So really thinking about like, you're gonna give some garlic, but you might wanna give some candy with it or some trail mix and realize when you're giving garlic, if you give tons of garlic, that person's gonna shut off, right? So I think it, it gets down to the kind of emotional part of having to give somebody um, feedback and how difficult that is. Um, yeah, some great conversation going on in the chat. Um, and so uh, as I'm kind of looking through this document and seeing if there's anything else I can help people draw out of this, I encourage you to, you don't have to give it to me, but just practicing that idea of uh, sugar, trail mix, garlic, what feedback would you give me about this workshop? And just writing it down on the side as we're thinking about this. And you don't have to share it with me. You can if you want, um, all three, but just practicing that and seeing how it kind of turns it into a different um, type of giving feedback. So if people wanna take a few minutes to do that, while I uh, look through this and see what we wanna draw out.
All right. Was that easy? Yeah. Was any easier than the other? I think trail mix is actually the hardest for me. <laughs> um, okay, so group, wonderful group six, you got all the way to um, incorporating skill building. Do any of you want to kind of talk, tell us what you were discussing about that and what you've, you would like to share with us? Looks like this tray is spoken up. Nancy, Emily, Stephanie, Madeline, or Alex. Do one of you want, want to jump in and tell us about your conversation around how to how to do the skill building in this? Well, I should say we got to the end because we sort of skipped the middle. So we only look like we did better, but but we didn't. Um, <laughs> we talked about a couple of experiences we had um, talking to the students about how they should think about the skills that we have. So it's sort of the mega meta reflection and metacognition approach as well. Um, I talked to my students a lot about writing for the public and if they're going to put a digital project out onto the internet, there's a value in thinking about different audiences <laughs> and there's a value in thinking about how you communicate out of the classroom um, and I can tie that to them for things like jobs and um, starting positions especially I'm an English professor and for English majors um, so that tends to go over pretty well and I also mentioned I don't tell them this part but I think that sometimes they're willing to put in a little bit more work especially in revisions for something that's public than something only I will see because they don't want to be embarrassed um, which, which is good and I didn't say this there actually, but I, I tie that into sometimes I do like a release party at the end. So it's for the final exam, I tell them to invite their friends, I, which they do sometimes, but mostly they don't. Sometimes other faculty come, I send out snacks. So, so like this public unveiling is something that also I think leads them to want to do better so they're not embarrassed. Um, Trey talked about um, some terms I thought I, I thought were really useful, thinking about competency and comfort. So rather than mastering one particular tool or skill, getting introduced to a lot of different tools to get a handle on it, to try to use it and to figure out what's best for them. Um, I thought that was really useful. And I think also ties into this like practical nature of being able to say, you know, on your resume for your internship or your first job, I've worked with these different tools. Here's a project that I finished. Here's something um, that I can do. Um, that's not, I don't know if that's exactly about incorporating the skill building, but it, it helps, I know for me to sell it to them that they feel like a lot of their work in a class is just sort of jumping through hoops or reporting back what they've learned. And I focus a lot on the fact that I design these projects in parts, they have something to show potential employers um, for internships and jobs seem to respond really well to that, to thinking about the ways in which reading and writing and design, which I haven't used the term design with them. It came up earlier in this workshop, but I'm gonna start doing it a lot more. I think that'll be really valuable. Can sell them on the fact that their college work matters and is building something specifically towards their careers since they're all concerned about what sort of jobs they'll get with their humanities majors. Yeah, really, really great points, Nancy. And making that very transparent to them is is really helpful to help them connect and, and engage with the material as well. Right. Any other additions to community and team? Uh, sorry, not community and team building, uh, incorporating skill building. All right. Well, that document is open. Everyone can look at what you've said if you'd rather uh, read than speak, for sure. Um, so please uh, feel free to refer back to that. There's also a couple links that um, Cheryl was mentioning that people have shared about good um, icebreakers. Um, what I would like to do is give teams the time to reflect on some of these suggestions that have been mentioned and how they might use it in their actual project. Um, so Ben has graciously created um, new breakout rooms. So teams are going to be together and then the rest of you 
get to meet new people or see familiar faces. Um, and you're gonna do something a little bit different. So first I'm gonna let teams know what they're doing and let them go and then maybe let the group get a little bit smaller and talk about what that second uh, group of people is doing. Does that make sense? Oh no, breakout rooms happen all at once. Cannot do that. Yeah, so I was gonna say. Uh, hmm. yeah, let me quickly share my screen um, to show you activity uh, document number two, not to give you a million um, Google Docs. This one, I didn't break up into groups as much. They're really just leading questions. You can take notes in whatever form uh, makes sense for your group. So it really isn't about adding to the document. The other one was kind of sharing of expertise and ideas so that we all have something to draw from and I'll clean that up for folks. But this one really is, this is just for the questions um, that I want you to be thinking about. So hopefully to help um, the codex folks and things that all of us are thinking about, um, let me share this as well, and you can look at it either way. That's not it. This is it. Okay. So questions for teams is up at the top, and those are pretty straightforward. It's basically all the things that we've been talking about. How can you apply it to your actual project? And again, you can take notes, kind of copy and paste here and do it here, or just take notes in the place that you want to. The mixed group is down here, and this is kind of going off what happened this morning. Um, in terms of what Codex folks might be talking about. And this time that we're in with online learning, possibly asynchronous learning, what does project-based work mean in this time? And so discussing what the elements are that um, make it, uh, that lend themselves to this type of environment. And then what are the ones that are more difficult to do online and should they be abandoned? In, or should they uh, be incorporated into what we're doing? So kind of, we are uh, picking your brains because all of us have been thinking about this. And so just having the opportunity to all think about this together. Um, and so you will be with a group of mixed uh, roles, most likely. Um, and so any questions about that? And I'm gonna give, this is a short one. I'm gonna give you 10 minutes. That's it. And I'll just add it. If uh, for any reason I messed up a group uh, and you find yourself not, if you're, if you're part of the Codex uh, Institute, if you're not, if you're finding you're not in your own team, uh, just leave the group and we'll move you back in. Um, for everybody else, it should be, should be fine. Just wanted to add that. Great. So I think some folks are saying keep collaborating in documents so that we can still all share. And absolutely. Um, I'm sorry I didn't break it up as easily this time. Okay, so yeah, you can call us in or you can call me into the meeting with the little help button if you're in the wrong group. Welcome back, everyone. People are sharing uh, resources, looks like. So we only have about five minutes. I want to make sure um, that any lingering questions get answered or brought up. Um, you know, I know, Ben, that folks are going to be discussing this stuff, but maybe this, this document that people have just discussed right now um, about how project-based learning uh, works in this environment or does not might be a good way to start off that conversation, I was Absolutely. thinking, especially because mm -hmm. this is a larger group. Yep. Um, but some really, really key ideas going on in the group. I hope you got something out of that. Um, is there anything folks want to specifically share here? Um, I do want to give a shout out to the Crash and Burn group who were talking about how important it is and how many of us are crashing and burning so much these days and it's okay and let's, let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> there was some really nice discussion about how asynchronous can sometimes really help people um, take part in a group project if they know what their tasks are. Um, so really knowing and then just being able to like go and do it if you might not be able to do that so much in a classroom environment. So being really clear with tasks. Did anyone else want to, the group? Yeah, Calvin, jump in, please. So yeah, we, we talked a lot about that in, in our group. And I think what we kind of settled on is that uh, asynchronous uh, online learning uh, can really lend itself to um, 
uh, students possibly, you know, um, working at, you know, their own pace, you know, it can, it can help in a lot of ways. But the thing that you need to keep in mind is um, uh, everything needs to be so much more structured. And that was a lot of what we talked about across all three questions was, um, you know, if they have trouble with some of the technology, do you have a structured time when they can talk to you or a structured time when they can always reach classmates? Uh, when you're giving them uh, online tools to work with like Twine or Scalar, do you have a structured time when you can teach them that? But also, uh, are, you, are you telling them up front, this is what you'll be doing with that? so that they aren't trying to learn every little bit of those tools and are just focusing on the bits that they need. Um, and so I, I think a lot of what we talked about is, you know, online and asynchronous education can be really helpful, but you really wanna make sure that as, as the instructor, that you've thought ahead and that you are um, making sure that the students know that there are these specific benchmarks uh, and specific times when they can always get the help that they need. Thanks, Calvin. We are at almost 3.30 here. I want to respect people's time and thank everyone for um, sharing and adding to this session because really it is about the people. Um, I hope you got some takeaways from this. Um, again, those documents are for you. Um, and I'm happy to meet with groups individually to talk about how you might um, build this into your own projects as you're, as you're thinking about this and just brainstorm ways to do that. So um, have a great afternoon, folks. Ben, I don't know if you want to say anything else. No, just thank you so much. Uh, thank you for making this interactive. I think we're doing a lot of sitting in front of the computer. And even though we're still sitting in front of the computer, at least we're, you know, we're talking uh, and thinking. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, I, do hope, I do hope our teams take advantage of your, your time and your expertise this week. Um, and you know, we didn't really say this at the beginning, but for the folks that aren't, uh, which completely my fault. Uh, for the folks that aren't participating in this week uh, of the Summer Institute that we're you know, doing this week, uh, we are doing a Summer Institute this week called Codex with a collaborative for engagement, uh, digital engagement and experience, um, which is a new, a new pilot that we're, we're trying this year um, that is bringing teams of teaching faculty and librarians and technologists and students together to kind of think about their courses, you know, or modules within those courses about ways of, you know, uh, more seamlessly or, or integrating these sort of digital projects, digital components into into the teaching. So uh, that's what a lot of work is. That's, that's what the work is happening this week. Um, and we hope to do that uh, for the next three years. Uh, we have a little bit of funding from the Hewlett Foundation to help us do that. So hopefully some of you who aren't there this year will be there next year um, if this work continues. And uh, uh, look, look forward to hearing more. So, but again, thank you so much, uh, Sunday, and uh, great to have you on board. And thanks to everyone here who who participated. Thank you.